Hello everyone, welcome to another UIC Urban Health Club virtual series. Today we will be focusing on public health. Hey guys, so by now you should be pretty familiar with these remote learning packets given by CPS. Uh, we're going to go over one today on Civic. It's a Civics Independent Project where we're going to cover the responsibilities of, of society and how we are working together to combat the spread of COVID-19. But before anything, let's review the basics of COVID-19. So COVID disease is caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and this virus causes mild to serious respiratory illness in people. Um, the signs and symptoms include fever, shortness of breath, fatigue, cough, sore throat, loss of taste, or smell. People who are asymptomatic, which do not show any symptoms, can also be infectious. Risk factors include older individuals um, older than 65 years of age, um, obesity and pre-existing medical conditions, such as diabetes and hypertension. Transmission is through respiratory droplets. Um, as of right now, there's no specific treatment, but there is a vaccine in the works. Um, diagnostic tests, also known as PCR, polymerase chain reaction tests, are done to test people with sign and symptoms. And antibody tests show that you were infected once with the virus in the past, but have antibodies in your blood. All right, guys. So we're going we're gonna to watch a video uh, directly from the CDC on how COVID-19 actually spreads within a community. Hello, I'm Dr. Isaac Genai. I was part of a team that authored an article published on April 8, 2020, in CDC's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, which reveals important new information about how COVID-19 can spread in a community. Large family gatherings can be a way to spread COVID-19 in communities, as illustrated in the cluster of cases detailed in this report. Patient A1.1, the initial patient in this investigation, was part of family cluster A. Patient A1.1 was the first case and represented the first transmission generation. In February 2020, a funeral was held for someone who died of non-COVID-19 causes. A close friend of the family, patient A1.1, shared a meal with members of the bereaved family, family B, the night before the funeral. Patient A1.1 had recently traveled out of state and had mild respiratory symptoms. Patient A1.1 had close contact with members of family B at the funeral. Three members of family B developed COVID-19 symptoms in the days following the funeral. Patient B2.1 was hospitalized. Patient B3.1 developed symptoms days after embracing patient B2.1 while at the hospital, while not wearing personal protective equipment or PPE. Ultimately, patient B2.1 died on day 28. Three days after the funeral, A1.1 attended a birthday party with nine other members of family A, seven party attendees, then developed symptoms of COVID-19. Three were confirmed to have COVID-19 and four others were diagnosed with probable COVID-19. Patients A2.1 and A2.2 were hospitalized and ultimately died. One family member and a home care professional developed probable COVID-19 after providing personal care for A2.1 without using PPE. Patient A3.1 likely spread the disease to patient A4.1 a household contact who did not attend the birthday party. Three birthday party attendees with probable COVID-19 attended church six days after developing symptoms. Patient D3.1 developed COVID-19 following close contact with these patients at church. This cluster ultimately resulted in 16 cases and three deaths and highlights how quickly the virus can spread in the community. Staying home and avoiding large gatherings are key to slowing the spread of COVID-19. So as you guys can see, COVID-19 spreads very easily. Um, you might not think so, but we are a society of very social people, even before uh, we started implementing uh, quarantine. So, we, you know, we all go to school, a lot of us work. So definitely we're going to be talking about some of the precautions that um, certain people are taking in order to stop the spread of COVID. Okay, so for activity one, 
you can get a sheet of paper and a writing utensil, or you can simply think about these questions. So these questions basically help you explore how civic engagement um, can combat the spread and threat of disease. So with A, how do we already know about COVID-19 and where can we find some information? So if you look back at the previous slides, we talked about the basics of COVID-19. And also at the end of the lecture, there are some terms that you can look at as well. Um, some credible sources that you can look at are the CDC, um, WHO, Illinois Department some, of Public Health and Chicago Department of Public Health. Um, those are some to name a few. So for B, what do you already know about how, how individuals, communities, organizations, and the government are responding to COVID-19? So one way is to start with yourself and kind of think um, around you as in your community, your local organizations, and overall the government. So each level influences each other and basically the social environment, which is um, going on during COVID-19. And this is also noted to be um, the social ecological model in public health. For part C, it says review the project question to explore uh, how can we participate for the well-being of our communities by also looking at the project title about responsibilities of every single participant. So basically think about the actions and inactions you can take in order to age yourself and the communities that you live in. All right, next we're gonna be talking about engaging in preliminary secondary research, which is the gathering of information already collected by someone else. As we collect information from the internet, we encourage you to reflect over the following points. Like, what new information did you learn? What protective measures have you and your family taken to avoid the virus? What have you learned about your, your social responsibility and other important information you learned that is important to understand to answer the following question. How can we participate for the well-being of our community? Uh, we're not going to review the uh, box video posted here, but we do encourage you to watch it on your own time. Now that you would have finished your secondary research, you're now going to engage in primary research. So now you're gonna be the researcher and you're gonna gather information from the source and you're gonna make your own conclusions on your findings. You can interview two or, or more family members or community members by phone, email, or social media. Try to get perspectives from different ages if possible. Uh, you can ask questions like, how did you know about COVID-19 virus? Or how did how the outbreak impacted your life? Um, what are you doing to lessen the spread of COVID-19? And are you uh, following the social distancing pr uh, protective measures? Or you can create your own questions. For example, you can ask, how has COVID-19 changed the way that you interacted um, or communicated with others? After you finish your interviews, you should reflect on information that you've gained. So you should ask yourself questions like, what do you know now that you didn't know before? Did you did the responses that you get uh, you, that you received from anyone you interviewed surprise surprise you why or why not? Um, did you notice any trends in their answers? Uh, you should also note examples of ways people, organizations, and/or institutions are responding to COVID-19, and we're going to be discussing that in a little bit more detail in the next slide. All right, so the biggest, so we have the different communities that are kind of like, or participants rather, based on the title, that are the biggest uh, in like communities that are affecting uh, how this is spreading and, and other things. So the first place is like the individual, you know, it's like me, it's like you, it's like old man on Fridays that plays dominoes on the street, you know. Um, for non-government groups, it's like the, um, community programs, you know, businesses, hospitals, nonprofits, social and sport clubs, th those kinds of things. For government institutions, it's like, you know, as it says here, public entity serving the general population. So libraries, uh, police department, the, the sanitation, city council, that sort of thing, you know. So those are like the biggest groups we that are affecting this whole situation. And then in the next one, 
we're going to talk about like questions you can use to explore how these participants are responding to COVID. So like for individual, one question might be, uh, what, are, what, are every, what is every person doing that is helping or not helping one another uh, with the spread? And then for non-government organizations, I know myself, I had been part of the Chicago Quattro Orchestra, and although we can't meet in person anymore to practice, uh, we still have like online things. So what can non-government organizations and nonprofits do to still keep, you know, people engaged? And then government institutions, we have the example of the police department is now, or yeah, the police department is now wearing face masks, and this sort of thing for an added protection for themselves and others. You know, so what can government institutions also do to help with safety? Some other questions that you might be able to ask are, what are you doing as a part of those communities? So what are you doing as a, you know, a son, a daughter, uh, a granddaughter, a grandson, a brother, a sister to help um, your individual communities? What are you doing as a consumer when you can go out to the store? And what are you doing um, civically to, to prevent um, your community from, from getting the spread? Um, so based on the previous slide, you came up with a few questions, right? So now you have to ask yourself if you have the answers to those questions. Do you have like research that you can do or that you have done in order to answer them? And while you're doing your research, sometimes new questions come up and you got to ask yourself those questions and find out more information. Uh, and if you can't find them, try going to like additional sources. Uh, you know, they always tell you not to do Wikipedia, but that, you know, that's kind of true. So try to go to a primary source, you know, newspapers, uh, you know, the CDC, see what everyone's saying. And then try to take everything that you've looked at and just reflect over it. And yeah, move forward from there. Um, so next, I'll talk about a few organizations or um, projects that have been developed here in Chicago to help combat with COVID-19. So we're just going to play a little video in the background just so you guys can see what McCormick Place has been looking like when it's first started building. But McCormick Place is usually a location where big events or conferences take place. Um, but during this pandemic, it was transformed into a temporary hospital where the goal was to build as many beds and rooms to help hospitals during the beginning of the pandemic. It was thought that hospitals were gonna become overwhelmed with patients. So the goal was to take the less critical patients to McCormick Place and leave the more critical patients in the hospital to be treated over there. Um, but it was initially thought that it was gonna be at its full capacity, but recently it was announced that um, it will be closing soon because only about less than 50 patients were transported to McCormick Place. So thankfully it wasn't used as how it was thought to be. But um, as you guys can see in the video, a lot of government officials took place into this project. Both local and federal governments played a role in creating this project. For example, like Governor J.B. Prisker and Mayor Lori Lifeboat had to work together to make sure to find a perfect location to build this. They had to um, get approval from McCormick Place. Then we have help from the federal government, such as FEMA or the UIC, the U.S. Army Corps. They all worked together to make sure to construct the beds, the, the um, equipment that needed to be transported into this. So all of these both stakeholders work together to construct this project um, in McCormick Place. So next, we will talk about an organization that has helped um, vulnerable communities during this pandemic. So this organization is called We Got Us. So this took place with the help of different organizations such as Healthy Hood, Youth Health Services Corps. All of these organizations listed at the bottom worked together and the goal was to help black and brown communities in Chicago that had been affected by COVID-19. So for example, um, in the picture, you guys can see that they had an event in the west side of Chicago where they gave out food, groceries to people, um, PPE, personal protective equipment, such as masks, gloves. They also give care packages to families with all these things. So that's something that they have done to help people that have been um, 
suffering from this pandemic to make sure that they get the resources that they need. And next, we will talk about my blog, My Hood, My City, and we're gonna play a video for you guys. Right now, the people behind us are making care packets. So they're putting perishables, they're putting canned goods, they're putting hand sanitizer, they're putting disinfectant spray, they're putting toilet paper in these care boxes, and we're gonna be delivering them to over 70 community areas in Chicago. Man, I think with everything going on with Corona, it's really easy to feel hopeless and helpless. And this was a really easy way for us to engage with our community and do something small that really makes a big difference. We have a package for you. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. At My Block, My Hood, My City, we're about taking direct action in neighborhoods when there's a need, right? So when it, when it snows really bad, we're there to shovel for seniors. When it was a heat wave last year, we were passing out waters and fans. Right now with coronavirus, we know that seniors are gonna be the most affected, so we're trying to help them now. We're actually on our way to drop off your care package. Oh, how sweet. All right. Awesome, so we should be there very soon. Okay, All right. I'll look out for you. That's a wonderful thing that you're doing for mm. seniors. You're gonna be blessed by this. Uh, just to see the faces of, of the people that answered, <laughs> um, they, they were so grateful for people to, to notice them in a time that probably feels like they're, they're easily forgotten. Then thank oh, you yeah. guys. Thank you. All right. Be safe. We will, you yes. If you can go to our website, formyblog.org, you can make a donation or you can, um, you can donate goods and we can, we can deliver them as you see what's going on. I'm really grateful for the work that they're doing in this community. Just an honor to be a part of it. So my block, my hood, my city, as you guys saw from the video, um, they have been playing a role in helping um, senior citizens during this pandemic specifically. They have been distributing care packages. So usually my block, my hood, my city, they work with students um, and providing them with extra resources. So during this time, the students has helped um, to deliver these care packages to senior citizens, which are one of the most like vulnerable populations during this pandemic. So they have contributed to that. And all of these organizations that I mentioned in the McCormick Place have played a role in helping combat the spread of COVID-19. So next we will talk about activity number three. All right, so now activity three, we're gonna communicate, we're communicating conclusions and taking informed actions. So in part one, based on what you've learned and the research you have done so far, make a claim or claims of how uh, democratic participants can participate in the fight against the spread and threat of COVID-19. From the research that you've done, make sure they're reliable uh, sources, such as don't use Wikipedia, like Daniel said, and also make sure you're citing the three examples uh, from the sources you investigated. Uh, from there, you can do this with a shortened, you can do this as a shortened written reflection and in graphic, infographic, a visual representation, or you could just choose the format. Now we're going to go on to the next slide. So from here, we're going to watch a video, which is short. Math can show us the future of the coronavirus. Here's how. At the beginning of an, of an outbreak, because it's a new infection coming into a population, pretty much everyone is susceptible to infection. So when you're infectious, pretty much everyone you meet, there's the potential for transmission to happen there. And so, for example, uh, the first person might infect two people, each of those might infect two people, each of those infect two. And so we have exponential growth. So the curve goes upwards and it gets steeper over time. That example represents an R0 value of two. An R0 value, or reproduction number, explains how many people a single person can infect. But changing the R0 value up or down can significantly impact how a disease spreads. The high R value is gonna give you a faster growing curve, and you'll see a higher peak, but also it'll um, burn through the population more quickly. A medium will, will grow not as quickly, the epidemic will last longer, um, and then it'll, it'll decay away. And the slower R0 uh, would have a slower burn through the population, would have a lower peak, um, but the in epidemic would last longer. That's why the term flattening the curve is so important. Actions like social distancing will create a slower, longer curve that's better for our health system. However, it could also negatively impact our economy. 
but if we can keep the R0 value below 1, we can get the outbreak under control. All right, so understanding the important, so this is why flattening the curve is extremely important. So incubation periods range, they range from day two to day 14. An incubation period is basically just like the time from the moment you you were exposed to COVID-19 until the signs and symptoms appear. And then the infection period begins two days before the start of signs and symptoms and, la and lasts at least 10 days after onset of illness. People can transmit the virus during the infection period. That's why it's extremely important to do social distancing. And asymptomatic people can also be infectious. So asymptomatic is basically when you don't show symptoms. So that's why COVID is really like dangerous as well, or that's why it spreads so quickly, just because there are people that have it that don't have the symptoms. All right. All right, so now we're going to talk about what community is. So obviously, right now in your household, that would be uh, your family and your friends. So first, let's look at the circle. So the first one in the middle is just you, yourself. And then from obviously the one that goes, the next uh, circle would be your family, your friends. So it could be people in your household. And then your local community, as it says there, could be your school, your churches, your businesses. Uh, it could also be like your neighborhood. National community is a much, it covers all of that. And it's, it's a much larger population. And then your global community is obviously overall globally the community there's like a bunch of different things that can encompass a community you kind of um unknowingly you kind of put yourselves in different communities as well um, we are a community as well um urban health club is definitely a community we help each other out um you kind of make what you want out of your communities you kind of put in the work that you want to do and you kind of um, get what you want to get out of each each of your communities All right, so now that we know uh, what community is and how we could classify uh, something as a community, so based on the proximity and fellowship, describe one or two, one to three communities you belong to. So this could, like uh, Donnie said, it could be one example of a community could be within us, the Urban Health Club. Another could be your family or uh, the third one could be your neighborhood, for example. And then from there, uh, know if these communities represent or are connected to a group of individuals, an NGO or a government institution, for example, your family uh, would be a group of individuals or uh, a youth center in your community could be an NGO and CPS would be a government institution. Okay. So once we have our communities listed, uh, I would suggest you to pick uh, the one that you feel like is the most important to you. So from here, the members, of, uh, we're gonna try to make sure that we, the following steps are to make sure that you guys that you guys know how to raise awareness in this community. Uh, so step one would just be reflect upon what you learned about ways through uh, to spread the threat of COVID-19. Step two, just identify who needs this information and why they need it. Uh, step three, just identify what you want to say and how you want to say it. What could you say to this audience to promote the type of response you want to see? Uh, step four would be um, choose the best way to reach the community you identify with the information. You want to uh, know, you want them to know or consider. Depending on the community, it could be a conversation with your family uh, during dinner. Uh, it could be phone call, a letter to an institution or government leader. Uh, for step five, just construct your message based on the on the means you decide in step four. And then finally, just implement your plan and make sure to document your actions along the way. Uh, track your outcomes if you can and how did people respond. So an example, if, if I were to follow all these steps, uh, I first, I would probably pick my friends or my family. Um, for step th uh, three, I would probably talk about uh, social distancing just because right now it we all know the importance of social distancing and the impact it could actually make on 
reducing the COVID-19 cases this year so far. Step four, I would probably choose uh, using social, social, social media just because I really don't want to call every single one of my friends. I have a lot. So that would be pretty hard. Um, but yeah, I think step four, I would definitely use uh, either Instagram or Twitter. You could definitely just retweeting something could go also a long way because if it's if your friend obviously follows you, they're going to see it. They're going to be like, oh, OK, like she took her time to actually retweet something. So let me go ahead and read the title at least. And that could be really uh, intriguing as well. So and step five would be just to construct your message based on the means that you decide step four. So I would probably if I were to do it on Instagram, I could do a story or I could just uh, take a picture of myself uh showing how i'm social distancing and then on the and then just write a comment about the importance of social distancing and how it could truly impact uh or reduce the cases of COVID 19. all right so after you guys have made like uh, have come up with your strategy um kind of um go back and see how that um, how you're you're going about contacting your community. So like in the examples previous, it could have been a letter to um, the governor or somebody in higher power. It could have been as simple as Diana's example of uh, a social media post, right? So um, you can think about how and who and what members of the community that you're actually targeting. So for example, um, where Diana's example was um, talking about her family and her friends, right? So um, you can even kind of tailor your social media uh, to a specific community, you know, because, uh, you know, I have more uh, family on my Facebook than my Instagram, you know? So it's different content for different things. You contact different members um, in, in different ways. Um, and really look about... Uh, really look back and see what you've learned throughout the process so um it you know it sounds a little daunting and it sounds you know uh kind of intimidating that you know who's going to listen to me but you'd be surprised you know a simple retweet or a simple post um, can go a long way especially when you're um you know giving out facts um and reflect about the whole project i think uh, personally i think the best way to you know, better the community is through education. Um, you know, simply stating or simply explaining what you've learned um, throughout this process. We've given you guys a lot of resources, a lot of videos, um, a lot of information. Feel free to share the videos that we've sent you, the CDC articles, the, you know, the templates, um, you know, to really try to, you know, share the knowledge that we've given you guys and what you've learned um, throughout school. All right, so we're going to go on to the next activity. Well, not an activity, but uh, so we've got talked about a lot of things. We've gone through a few activities, but as per usual, there's always more. And if you'd like to check it out, we have a link here that you could click on on the presentation yourself. And in the following two slides, we have some useful terminology that you can use while completing these activities, you know, that can help you in, in, in what you're doing. And thank you so much for watching. If you, and we hope you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can uh, reach out to us via email. We'll get back to you when we can. And also follow us on Instagram.